Okay, folks. <laughs> okay, so we have to start because of time. Who wants the job of getting people in? <laughs> okay, cool. So Alvaro de Franci was born in London uh, in the 70, early 70s, spent his, most of his childhood in Portugal and his adult working life in the UK since the late 80s, having recently emigrated uh, back to Portugal with his wife and two children. He graduated in 1991 in business studies at University of East London, um, and he's the chairman of three eponymous brands and successful business operating in interiors and architecture sectors in the very heart of London. Having learned about Iboga in 2013 and discovered its benefits, Alvaro embarked on the arduous task of organizing clinical trials with Ibogaine in HCL in Portugal. The whole team, from a reputable manufacturer with a solid protocol, a principal investigator, the CRO, project managers, and a first-class clinic have all been assembled. In addition, Alvaro presented Iboga and Ibogaine to Dr. Joao Golau, the National Drug Coordinator for Portugal and the head of SICAD, the General Directorate for Intervention on Addictive Behaviours and Dependencies. <laughs> Alvaro has a keen interest in the therapeutic benefits of iboga and other entheogens, especially the part they play with arresting addiction to harmful substances and behaviours. More importantly, his focus is on holistic, consistent, compassionate aftercare. Alvaro is co-owner of the visionary and ambitious Tabula Rasa retreat project in Portugal. Alvaro. Thank you very much. Um, Right, I could probably do with a PowerPoint operator. Um, involves just tapping an arrow button. Yes, please. That would be great. Yes, yeah, so I guess I think you probably just want that guy there at the end. No, it's not even on here. Where is it? Is it here? Oh, yeah, cool. Whoa. Okay, we'll just skip through that. Yeah, that's enough publicity. Right, okay. Yeah, there are a few people I wanted to thank, but they're not actually here, so I'm gonna save it to the end. Um, I'm not going to go too deeply into my story. I shared that um, 14 months ago at the Ibogaine, European Ibogaine Forum in Vienna. But effectively, and I wrote this down because this is actually from the NA Just for Today reading. And um, I'm grateful to Ibogaine because it helped me survive my emotions. And that is pretty much what Ibogaine did for me and what I try to or strive to, to achieve for um, patients generally. So they survive their emotions. So, um, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so I've um, divided my presentation into several sections. I'm particularly keen to share with you what my views are on what uh, Ibogaine Clinic could look like, setting the gold standard of treatments and pre and after care the patient journey from the start and for life, so that goes beyond the walls of a treatment center, an Ibogaine specific fellowship, data collection follow-up, staff well-being, which is um, often overlooked, and um, challenges, lessons, and our vision going forward. Okay, uh, you've got to tap it twice sometimes. Ooh. Yeah, it is a long road, by the way. It's um, not easy. Um, what happens with uh, a lot of us when we take Ibogaine, me included, is that we think, this is it. This is the thing I want to do. I'm going to save addicts from the depths of addiction, and um, I'm just going to get working. And that often is the case for providers, and I was lucky enough to still have quite a lot of lessons to learn after finding Iboga, and realize that Iboga on its own is just not enough. 
And that was a really hard lesson to learn because I actually hit the ground running and tripped over a few times. And interestingly, it wasn't actually Iboga that got me clean. I actually got clean on, m on my own terms, I guess. But it started the journey for me, which is really important. Okay, next slide, please. So I've um, been working on this concept for about four years now. And it all started because of an Ibogaine journey that I took in Holland. And there was a lot good about the treatment that I had, but there was also a lot failing from what could have been done right through from failure to pick me up at the airport, try and negotiate public transport, and actually leaving earlier than I should have, walking aimlessly around Amsterdam, not knowing where I was. It was a lot, a lot of lessons to learn. So um, when you're looking at a project such as an Ibogaine clinic, I think it's important to have a vision, a vision of where you want to go and actually why you are doing this. Now that vision can simply be, I want to help addicts, I'm going to work out of my home and treat them. That vision is cool. Um, we had that vision for a while doing Airbnb treatments and they, most of the treatments went exceptionally well, no adverse events, quite good results actually from people that came through through our hands, but it just wasn't enough. And we just realized early on that safety was paramount. We also realized, should I say I realized, and um, also talking to colleagues, friends in the Ibogaine community, that we need to do a di bit of, and I'm going to try and pronounce this, de-Ibogainization. There is too much emphasis on Ibogaine. I believe firmly that Ibogaine is a tool in a larger toolbox of recovery. I believe that these events are essential for moving Ibogaine forward, but Ibogaine is missing the center stage in mainstream and traditional um, addiction models. And um, I'll talk to you a bit about that later on. But I really think we need to bring Ibogaine down a peg or two and realize that it actually works with many other adjunct therapies. And I do believe that this message is not got across enough. You know, I, I was talk talking to Gareth earlier. You know, my aim most days is to try and get as many no's out as possible. You know, people are not all able to get help with Ibogaine. It doesn't work for everybody. Okay, so aside from having a common vision, you need a bit of money. Money is really important when you're setting up an Ibogaine clinic. And this will become apparent as we go down the list. You also need a bit of business acumen. Now, um, I often wonder when I read about people in the Ibogaine community, and there are no names because I actually don't have names for who the people could be, but we hear about, I've done 900 treatments, I've done 3,000 treatments. Well, where the fuck is all that money going? I mean, that is serious, lucrative business. You know, where is it being shared into the community pot for clinical trials? You know, what's happening here? So I believe you need business acumen. You need to actually have a business plan. You need to look at what your costs are. You need to look at the bottom line. You need to understand what your costs are, how many patients you need to break even, and what you're going to do with those profits. You might want to be philanthropy, thru, uh, philanthro, how do you say it? philanthropic about it and put some money aside for a, a sponsorship fund for people less able to receive Ibogaine. Or you may want to increase your business, do whatever you need, or stock up on Ibogaine. Now, money is also important because you need Ibogaine stock. You need reliable Ibogaine stock. And you can't run out of stock while you've got a house full of patients. And I understand that this often can be a problem when you're trying to import little batches of Ibogaine through customs. They don't arrive in time, and you've got a house full of patients and no Iboga. So it's essential to maintain inventory, maintain stock of equipment, of Ibogaine product, of medication. It really needs a lot more thought. And this is why I've gone down this route. You need a building. Now, it's great to get a building, you know, find a remote location in the middle of nowhere in the wilderness. Brilliant idea. Patients can't escape that easily. Try finding staff. No one wants to live 
in the middle of nowhere. People want to live in the big cities. So you've got a major staffing problem, how to attract people to actually join your team in a quite dangerous environment in terms of safety and encourage them to actually leave their families and come and work in a remote location. So that has its challenges as well. And of course, the um, quality of Ibogaine. You know, as Fred, um, Dr. Fred mentioned earlier, you know, we don't really know what we're administering, especially when the shelf life of the product is not completely controllable. So that's a, a major concern. And then let's just, you know, we've got the building, we've, we've got the business going, then you need people. So you need a client manager, someone that's the interface between the client or the patient to deal with all the logistical aspects, to deal with the intake, with the questionnaires, with the, 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 the vetting that is appropriate for, for the client manager. You've got the operations manager who runs the grounds, who deals with all the, um, the other staff outside of the building, working on the grounds, cleaning staff, um, groceries, supplies, stock. You need a chef, very important job, and um, really important job. And um, yeah, you know, we want to put nourishment into our clients. We also got the people that maintain the properties. You know, you've got cleaners, you've got grounds, you've got animals to look after. You know, this is the concept that, that we play with. Then you've got the medical team. Now, um, you know, this is a very... Pardon? Somebody say something. Dana? Dana? Did you say something? Oh, I thought you said Al. Okay. Um, so with the medical team, it's absolutely vital to train. And just before I talk about the medical aspect, um, the, if you look at a process of uh, an Ibogaine treatment, the end result is the Ibogaine treatment. But what we did is we started the training at back to front. We started training with the holistic therapies, got people on board, the, um, the caregivers and so on. And then we dealt with the medical aspect of the treatment. So we wanted to kind of get that bit, the pre-care and the post-care pretty solid so that that could actually support the Ibogaine treatment. So that's kind of how, how we did it. Now, we need a doctor, we need nurses, and then we need friends, advisors that can actually share information. What's absolutely vital is ACLS training. And we were really fortunate to receive um, Jamie, who's at the back there, for our first training stint, which was absolutely invaluable to um, the, the safety and learning. And we also had Anwar Jiwa as well, who came for the May, the May um, training session. So that, that was absolutely essential. And um, the training never stops. I mean, every Ibogaine treatment is training. And then we've got the therapists. Um, I'm a big believer in conventional um, addiction therapy. So the counselor that I chose to join my team is actually from a very well-respected traditional rehabilitation center in Scotland and um, Big 12 Stepper, but also um, involved with CBT and NLP. And I find that the steps are quite important, especially with an Ibogaine treatment or beyond. And not only, it doesn't work for everybody. It worked for me for a while, I have to say. And then we've got the holistic therapists. These people may be doing breath work. They may be doing kundalini yoga, meditation. Um, we do stretch it out sometimes where we, we may do a bit of psilocybin therapy when it's um, appropriate, which is incredibly effective. And then in traditional, sorry, it, well, in traditional rehab style, we've got a personal trainer, and then we deal with nutrition as well. Then you've got these guys, the boring people. You've got the bookkeeper. You've got the accountant, you've got the lawyer, you've got the dude in Chiang Mai blogging and creating posts. You've got the audio-visual guy, which happens to be my brother. And then you've got the other, other therapists that visit and get involved in the project. So you're already looking at about 20 people. Then you bring the advisory board, people that inspire you, you know, people like Bob Sisko, people like Jeremy, people like Claire Wilkins, Jamie, and so many other people that will go unmentioned. And then you've got other providers, other doctors, academics. And this one's really important. Tolerant wife and kids. Because um, when you're a family man and you're trying to do this, 
it is bloody hard work. And you, t you get taken away from your family and trying to balance life. And I think that it's absolutely vital that people doing this kind of stuff also have a support structure. My, I'm very lucky I have a support structure every Saturday, which is an online meeting with a rehab I went to many years ago. And it works. Please. <laughs> okay, right. I'm going to zoom through this because um, you can always check this out later. But when you look at a screen like this, there's a lot of work that goes into a patient. A hell of a lot of work. This isn't the Airbnb days when we used to say, get your tests. Oh, yeah, it looks all right. Come to Portugal. Meet you at the airport. Get you withdrawing. Give you Ibogaine and hope for the best. You know, we got the initial inquiry. We got to check out how these people are, what's their condition, what their motivation is like. They have to do a questionnaire. We got to check they have the means to pay. We've got to get all the medical tests that they have to undertake, and that has to be vetted by the medical team. Then, if necessary, more often than not, it is necessary. There is a Skype call with a doctor, so they can actually look at each other face to face and. Just check, really, the feedback that you're getting, whether there are any funnies going on. And then a multitude of checklists, which are all to do with logistics, passport, insurances. I mean, it goes on and on and on and on. And um, very important, preparation and pre-counseling. Now, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, but that's absolutely vital, setting up the patient for a successful Ibogaine treatment and getting them motivated and so on. But what's also important with this aspect and what we do at the first part of this little journey here is that I will never put more work in to the patient than the work that they need to put in. So they have to actually put the work in. And that's really important. They have to really show that they're ready and they need help. Then... Um, once they arrive with us, we've got the logistics, we've got to deal with um, urine testing, drug testing, we've got to do a search. Now, we strip them pretty much through their underwear and boxes. We haven't got to the stage of cavity searches yet, but I'm sure that's probably a consideration in the future because people have smuggled stuff in. I mean, that's going to happen. And um, we've got the house rules, the regulations. Um, I call this a sort of upfront contract. This is how it works, this is what we do, this is how we can help you. It's a bit like what your parents tell you when you're younger, my house, my rules, you know, and that's really important because you will get pushed and pushed, your boundaries will be pushed. And then the patients come in after all this testing, then they have the arduous task of form filling, and I would not like to be off a crack binge or just about maintained on morphine sulfate and having to fill in the forms that we actually get you to fill in. I mean, it's pretty bad. It's horrendous. The questions are repeated time and time again in different languages, different sentences. It's quite confusing, even for the people actually running that. So, And then we've got the orientation. The body allocation is really important. Get someone connecting early on with the, the patient when they come in so they have someone to talk to that's outside of the medical team and, and the providers and so on. Then we've got the informed consent. Never miss that step. Absolutely vital. And then what happens on the actual day of um, treatment? We either treat in the evening or the following day, but we get the, the therapy team involved with um, breath work or meditation, getting them moving, maybe a bit of exercise. Sometimes a bit of laughter therapy comes in. And then we've got some group counseling or one-to-one. -one. Often the one-to-one -one is more appropriate on day one because people are a bit shy and they're kind of just getting their bearings. And then we work on the letter writing and intention setting. That's really, really important. And I think it's important to have enough time to do this so that people really understand why they are at the place to receive Ibogaine. What are the reasons behind it? Intention's absolutely key. And then we do the ceremony. Now, every single treatment day, and we tend to have a treatment day on uh, Monday, Monday week or Tuesday, we undertake an emergency plan as if it's the first time we have done it. So that's really important. So everybody knows what their role is. We know who's phoning emergency services. 
We know who's um, racing up to the top of the dirt track to guide the emergency services down the road and so on. Really important. Never miss that. Never miss that. And then during the treatment itself, um, full medical monitoring. Um, I can't stress this enough. Um, what I have noticed, though, is that we have to balance between over being being over involved with the client when they're in the ibogaine journey and not interrupting that so this is an area that needs to, we need to get a little bit more clever at in a sort of more remote fashion and managing the gray day is interesting i believe we're quite good at dealing with it so that people don't get much of this but it does happen so it's really important that your therapists are ready to, to handle the gray days and actually preempt they could happen and try and work a way of avoiding them. Um, then as the week goes on, when people are coming out of their, 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 where they're feeling a bit lousy and so on, we get them into therapy, we get them exercise and get them moving so that everything starts working again. And generally they'll be go back with the counselor again looking at relapse prevention and on the day that they leave they fill in exit forms a lot of these forms are related to the form filling on day one where they come in so that we have comparables and if they're up to it we get a video testimonial and we get them to the airport um, the IRM is really important and I'll talk to you about that in a moment but this is for life and I think this is what makes all the difference with um, the client's well-being. Next slide, please. Okay, yeah, sorry, this is a little bit small. Um, right, okay, so the focus needs to be on pre-care, needs to be on care during the treatment at the center, aftercare, and reintegration. Now, um, you've got companies like Ibogaine Counseling Services, run by Anders and Ben, absolutely essential for the success and for setting someone up for a good Ibogaine treatment with a positive outcome. We've also got Being True to You. They are a similar outfit who also offer this type of service. Absolutely vital to focus on the aftercare planning and reintegration. This is really, really important. And the sense of fellowship, you know, it's important to introduce the 12 steps to people. At least show them that there may be a fellowship close to home, that there might be a smart recovery group, that they can actually work CBT and take techniques home with them and carry them on when they move forward into their normal lives. So, um, you know, we were talking about freedom yesterday. You know, having choice when you leave a, a treatment center, whether it's an Ibogaine or a traditional treatment center, it creates a freedom to design your own recovery path. And I think this is part of the empowerment. So you're giving people choice, and they can try things out, and they can work out what best works for them. I often get feedback saying, you know, I'm now doing yoga or I've taken up that sport I learned at the center or I'm now meditating and I'm using that Headspace app or whatever it's called. You know, it, people take bits that they learn and carry forward with it. So that's really, really important. Um, what we also do that I also encourage people to do when they leave the treatment center is to do daily check-ins. So you check in in the morning with your feelings. I feel like this. I feel like that, or this is coming up for me. Really important morning process groups. And then we introduce um, focus groups, which are topic related. So it could be about boundaries. It could be about the masks we wear. It could be about pause, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Very important one to focus on. So we talk about it in group and we share our experience together. Interestingly enough, not all my team are addicts, but they get involved. They all get involved because they're normal. Everybody's normal. Just because you're an addict doesn't mean you can't talk about your feelings and what's coming up for you. And the team do the same. So we all get involved in this, and it's very powerful. I also encourage people to write gratitude lists, set goals, and undertake daily practice. Now, I know personally when I don't do that, I tend to go that way. So that's really important. And of course, the buddy sponsorship model, which starts off when people come in, hopefully that buddy structure model will continue going forward. So this is um, really, really important. 
And um, getting people into meetings. I think you need that support when you leave a treatment center. Trouble with Ibogaine is it, it, it is so incredibly enlightening if you get that big, big treatment that you think you're all right. But actually, it does come back. You, you do go back to your old ways if you don't put the work in. <laughs> Next slide, please. Yeah, build that recovery muscle. Is that it? Okay, we're here, yeah. Okay, right. So um, this is where the um, alternative adjunct therapies come in. Now, always with traditional rehab best practices in mind, um, I think this is really important to, 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 to think about that because rehab practices haven't just turned up out of the blue. They've been going for a long time and have helped a lot of people. And we mustn't shun what works for many people. The system has a lot of flaws. I get that. But we need to work with what's working, fine-tune it, and bring it into today the way we want it to work with Ibogaine and so on. So this is really important uh, of really of note is breath work. Breath work on the day before treatment is incredible. It opens people up to the possibility of change and brings the emotions up and gets them ready. We do a lot of breath work. Sometimes they tell us too much, but we know it's helping. Kundalini yoga in the morning, first thing, get the body moving. Get the daily practice muscle going. Acupuncture, great for the opiate addicts. Exercise and fitness. I've seen people literally dragging themselves to exercise. But when they've done it, they feel a whole lot better. And they're there again the next morning doing it. So that must be working. We've got light therapy. We've got equine therapy. We're very fortunate to have horses and farm animals, which we keep away from Anwar when he comes. And the, <laughs> yeah, the mutton especially. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we get people involved in, in drumming, toning, really good stuff. You know, people take toning away with them, and they're toning in the morning, getting themselves, you know, grounded and getting themselves set up for the day. Really, really important. Getting the family involved is important as well. Often family are a big problem in the recovery of um, their children, and I think they're often overlooked, and they throw far too much kindness at their children when they leave a treatment center. It's actually doing them more harm than good. So it's really good to get them involved so they understand boundaries and what's good and what is not working, basically. Okay, so, um, yeah, we've got also tapping. Great technique, emotional freedom techniques, EMDR, which is great for trauma. Now, more recently, we've been doing a little bit of this. I won't say it on camera. Okay, this is great. This is really great. But don't give it to people when they first come in because they're too, too full of drugs to get any effect. It will be just like going out to a club and enjoying a little acid trip. This is great. Four weeks in, six months later, four years later, whatever. This really does peel back the stuff that you boga didn't get to or that actually came back. So I'd really consider looking at that more and more. Okay, right, next, um, next slide, please. Well, this, yeah, about four weeks. I mean, if, if the people are with us longer. No, no, it doesn't, it's not, yeah. Well, I don't really know too much about the dangers, so I can't really stress that. What I know is it doesn't really work, you know, if you're full of, toxins and drugs, the, the effect of the psilocybin is pretty limited. It, it does have an effect, but it's not so therapeutic and profound. That's, that's how I've, what I've found, but I don't know about the dangers of it. From what I understand, it's not so dangerous, but I can't be quoted on that. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, next one, please. So a typical week, as you can see, the patients are extremely busy. You've got the intake phase. You've got the, um, the next phase after lunch. You've got the ceremony. Ceremony is great. They, we have a fire ceremony. Everybody's involved. They're drumming, singing. And the patient sort of walks. He starts his rite of passage, which is really lovely. So that really works quite well to set them up. But a typical week, if we just get rid of the Ibogaine treatment, and especially for the people that stay for two, three weeks, is busy. They wake up, they do yoga, or they do a silent walk. 
it, which we try to keep it silent, but people just want to talk anyway. Um, you've got the process group. You've got the fitness or therapies. Um, you've got counseling. You, as you can see, you've got very little free time, really. We keep people busy so that by the time it, we hit 9.30, they're not really arguing with you that they go to bed early. You know, they're just shagged. They just want to go home. They don't want to go to sleep. So the typical week looks like this. And then on Sunday, for long, long-term stay, as we, we get them into an external activity, it could be whitewater rafting or... Um, we haven't done that many things actually because people don't stay for that many, that long period. But we go for walks or we go to little local towns and do some sightseeing, town parties. Yeah, no parties after I began. Okay, next slide, please. Right. Okay, this is um, what I call the IRM, which is the I began recovery movement. Now I believe having been involved in an online aftercare program for many years now, that that makes all the difference. It doesn't matter if you relapse. The people are still there for you, and um, you support each other. So this is um, a weekly online meeting that takes place. Well, if you want to embark on this, it could just take place as, uh, when you like, as many times as you like. But I recommend a weekly meeting. And it cre creates camaraderie. People share their experiences. They can relate to each other. And what's really important is my aim is to make it self-supporting so that I don't actually have to be there every week. So this is really important, that you build that muscle so that people self-support each other. I think that's really, really important. This takes place on Skype or could take place on Zoom. And it's growing and growing and growing, and I suggest that maybe we do something like Narcotics Anonymous in the rooms where people can actually dial in from anywhere in the world and talk Ibogaine and experience. And the topics that we cover could involve HALT, pause, relapse prevention, a spiritual program, stinking thinking, that's always a good one, you know, the monkey on the back and so on, uh, balance, Balance is really important. And actually looking beyond, you know, hopes, dreams, and goals. So what we tend to do is we just rotate it, and you'll find that that no longer applies next time, or that's confusing, or the thinking's come back, and people support each other. So it's, I think a, an Ibogaine-specific fellowship is really important. I'd like to see more of that, really, and I'm happy to help anyone want to, that wants to embark on this. Next slide, please. Okay, this is what it looks like. <laughs> so, some stooges having a meeting, talking about stuff. Clean, clean, getting clean. But he's still there, and that's what's important. He had to be dragged into the meeting, kicking and screaming, but he's clean now. So, that's the power of these meetings. You know, it, it actually does work. Next slide, please. Okay, right, looking at data collection and follow-up I think is really important. Now, um, I recommend that data is collected on intake, during the treatment and on exit, but more importantly, on the follow-up. This is the hardest part because people do go AWOL, but the beauty of it is if you got people on this earlier slide during your aftercare, they're more likely to still be in touch with your center. So you can actually go and collect this type of data, which is really important to show the efficacy of Ibogaine combined with adjunct therapies. And so this is really important. If you are collecting data, make sure it's HIPAA compliant. Make sure it's GDPR compliant. Really, really important because when the guys or the girls come knocking on the door wondering what you're doing, they can get you on this. They might not get you on the Ibogaine treatments, they'll get you on this. So be really careful about what you do with um, patient data. Really, really important. So um, about the data collection follow-up, I think this is a major area where we as a community fail. Too many people are doing their own thing. We need to unify data collection. I recommend that we organize a number of documents that should be quantified, completed, quantified, compared, and actually that go into a, a central database of some kind where we can actually still have 
ad hoc information, but information to back up what we're doing. Too much information is disappearing and not being accounted for. This, I think, is a game changer. And I think we need to really seriously consider this as providers. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm not gonna read all these out, but now you can see the pain that the patients feel when they come in. They gotta fill all this stuff out without fail. And um, it's really important because um, you can get comparables from this information. And um, you know, we need the comparison to show the efficacy of what we're doing. So um, you know, of particular importance is the ASI light, the DTCQ for drugs and alcohol, and the DAS42. But actually, the, um, for the opiate addicts, the SALs and the ooze, really, really important. Keep repeating them through the um, treatment process look at comparables and on exit as well. So yeah, are th these are some of the, well, some of the information I'd recommend collecting. Perhaps we could diminish it a bit. Next slide, please. So on exit, as you can see, another load of examinations. Um, yeah, this is what we do. Carry on, please. Okay, this is an area that's often overlooked is the staff well-being and I believe that it all starts with communication and um, I think we're getting pretty good at this and the staff also do a daily check-in so we check in with each other how we're doing how we're feeling what's coming up for us any issues and then we talk about the client and what the plan is for the day this happens every morning without fail and I think it's really important so that people know what they have to do and where they're at. And also if there are any issues we need to deal with. And then on a Friday, we do a little group circle meeting with the team and we talk about the week. And it gets a bit deeper than just about the clients. We talk about the stuff that really matters, the stuff that many of us never talked about when we were using. So this is really important, really important. And the fact that the staff get engaged in all the adjunct therapies as well. So if someone's feeling a bit down, throw them into breath work, go and hang out with the horses, or go and you know, do some exercise and so on. So it's really important to get, get the team involved as well. Plus, I believe if a patient sees a team getting involved, it actually motivates them even more because you know, we're talking to people that are non-addicts getting involved in normal activities, and I think it's important to actually lead by example, and that's what we do. So next slide, please. Okay, right, so um, potential challenges. I could go on all day about challenges. Um, right, so the problem that we have here in Portugal is that there are many requirements for rehab centers, clinics, so on and so forth. The red tape is um, pretty intense, and um, there's a lot of bureaucracy involved. It's not that easy. Um, decriminalization of drugs in Portugal means more regulation, so it just makes it quite difficult for, for this type of venture. We soldier on anyway. Of course, a reliable source of Ibogaine. Um, we've got the gray area here in Portugal, and you know, this is a business competition. We've got traditional rehabs competing against us. We've got, um, obviously, other, other Ibogaine providers in other countries and so on. Owning adverse events. Now, I got a load of stick for this. And um, I was told I was mad to release a video of an adverse event. And not the actual adverse event happening, the patient talking about his adverse event. And I'm actually very proud of our adverse events because people didn't die. And those people are all clean today. And if it wasn't for my exceptional team, those people wouldn't be here. So um, I think it's really important that this is owned and shared because only through sharing this stuff do we know what to look out for and to avoid? And I don't need to go into the reasons. So it's again about the transparency. Next slide, please. Okay, right. Um, pretty much following on from what um, Dr. Fred was talking about, about selection and so on, really, really important. Client management, managing the unmanageables, that's quite a task. Um, you know, the aspect of dishonesty, 
bringing drugs or not being honest about the drugs that they're taking, um, really pushing that code of conduct. You know, when you're in my house, you behave by my rules. Really, really important. Big problem is food. We have great food. But when you've been eating burgers and shitty food for so long, to go and start eating healthy food right away is pretty difficult for the system to digest. So just consider that sometimes you've got to be a bit flexible. Phone electronics policy, this is probably the biggest problem that we have. People want their phones. They want their gadgets. We take them away and we don't give them back. They'll get them on a Saturday for an hour. And um, yeah, this is the biggest problem that we have with people. They want to speak to whoever. And when we have been lax with this policy, it always leads to more trouble. Someone else said, oh, they had the phone, or I spoke to my mother, or this or that, and it's, it always goes pear-shaped. So take all the gadgets away, and good as throw them away. Now, another challenge when it comes to clients is the time frame. You know, we do take people in for a week. It's not enough. It really is not enough. I try to justify it because I get them into the Ibogaine recovery movement and can follow up and keep the care going, but it really isn't enough. You know, we've got the aspect of the, the opiate addicts get smashed to pieces. They really need another week. The stimulant addicts want to rule the world. They want to leave early. So we have, we have to kind of manage what's going on with these people. My aim is to hit the 28-day program. Now, there's more method in my madness than just keeping people in long, longer. I know that they have a better chance of building that recovery muscle, but this is a time frame that the insurance companies like. So this is, this is an area that's important to look at. Correct. So this is a, an area that I encourage anybody that's above board in this type of work to look at that support, because insurance companies will support you if you're above board. Right, and then um, client-related, it's heartbreaking when you have to turn people down because they don't have the financial means for treatment. Um, in the earlier days, we did, or I took some people on. They didn't put the respect and reverence into their treatment or put their money in their pocket and it didn't really work out so well for them. So um, this is an area that needs to be looked at, how to finance treatments. You know, do we set up a fund where people can build into it, pay into it so it reaches the level of where they can receive treatment? How, it's, it's really about getting the feedback from the person they're really going to make an effort to stay clean. It's like how, how we have to make them deserve to get treated, basically. They have to show us that they deserve to be treated. Everybody deserves to be treated, but you can't treat everybody. So they have to really want it. So this is an area that I'm looking at at the moment, which is setting up a fund for people less able to receive Ibogaine treatments. Next slide, please. Okay, yeah, we've talked about staff already. I'll just fast track. Bedside manner. Most of us are bloody lousy at bedside manner le le um, dealing with Ibogaine patients. Um, it's really important to understand what they're going through, especially when um, under a flood dose with Ibogaine. It's important to understand when to get involved and when to pull back. Um, this, this really takes a lot of practice, and I think it, it's actually sometimes the difference between a successful and a non-successful Ibogaine treatment. Bedside manner, very, very important. Empower your team. Get them involved. Get them involved in the client journey. Get them involved and get their ideas out. Try them out. There's no harm in trying out an idea. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, medical treatment and provision. Right, safety is a must. That has to be at the top of the chart every single time. Emergency planning, day of treatment, every single time. Also, the self-checking aspect. You know, are we ticking all the boxes every time we do a treatment? Are we getting lax and taking shortcuts? You know, are we, when are we going to regularly review what we're doing and improve on it? Very important. Now, um, this area has been really hard work for me. 
Flood doses are not for everyone. I had a groundbreaking, amazing Ibogaine experience. It was so fucking big that I want everyone to feel the same way I did. It doesn't happen. And um, it was a big lesson for me. And um, yeah, I've had to let go to that. And just, you know, we're all different. Some people are less able to receive Ibogaine in large doses. And sometimes you just have to go in slowly and leave the psycho-spiritual for the adjunct therapies, or they can come back later and try again. So this was, as Jeremy calls it, humble pie. Yeah, I got a lot of humble pie on that one. I still struggle with it, but I have to let go to that. Okay, um, experience creates intuitive treatments. You know, the more treatments we, we undertake, the more intuitively we can treat people. It's not just about milligrams per kilo. And I think we learned that quite quickly and early on. Also, balancing skill sets. You know, when, when you've got a nurse, uh, uh, sorry, a nurse to patient ratio of one to one, it is not enough. So you've got to bring in your adjunct therapist. You've got to bring in your team to actually get involved in the sitting sometimes so that people can get some rest. So you've got to really get some, some skill sets going, teach people the basics so that they are not scared to be helping and that they have the know-how and the ability to deal with something or call uh, a medic or a nurse when there is an issue. So this is really, really important. Um, I also said um, the actual counseling aspect is really important. Um, I don't tend to like much of that going on from the medical team into the counseling aspect, but it does have to happen sometimes. So it's really important that people have some crossover skills. Again, the bedside manner. Doctors and nurses are not that great at bedside manner. And I think it's really important that this is addressed regularly. And again, it's to do with the relationship with the client. So if you've got a good relationship with a client early on in the process, you're going to be much better at that. Training, essential, and uh, managing expectations also. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, right. Um, this eventually dries out, unfortunately. Finances get swallowed up. When you look at a team of 20-plus people, that really drains. So, you know, when you're a young Ibogaine treatment providing company or a rehab or a business, when you don't get orders or you got downtime, what do you do with that time? Because that's going downhill quickly. So I recommend that you look at what you're doing and um, you fine tune your systems and processes. You actually walk the patient walk and see what happens when you enter a treatment facility. You know, what, what do you do with a patient right through as they go through the building? How do you improve the processes? And we found that the downtime, although very costly, helped us improve what we do tenfold, right down to the lovely origami on the bed sheets. Really interesting, this downtime. Um, I'm a sales guy. I began treatments is bloody frustrating. I can't go and knock on your door and ask you whether you're addicted and whether you need help. I've got to wait for you to find us and ask for help. That is very, very frustrating, really frustrating. Really struggle with that in the, in the early months. Very important as well is looking for other markets. Now, you know, I run a business, so it's important to think about how are we are going to take this into the future and actually get a return and be able to invest in, in the community and, and trials and so on. So we have to run this like a business. Where else are we going to look for clients? You know, the, 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 you know the, the meth chemsex epidemic, executive burnout, really big market. Look at that. Ibogaine is incredibly good for helping people take stock of where they're going and what they're doing. Obviously, we know about the Parkinson's aspect. Food disorders, very effective for food disorders. So I'd look at that market as well. Look at bulimics, anorexics, people with big panic attack problems. It does help. Again, the insurance companies that we talked about, Okay, professional referral companies. This is very interesting. I, um, in the hours that I was between treatments and so on, I contacted about a thousand therapists on LinkedIn. Okay, I didn't speak to them, but you know the written written communication. 
Out of a thousand people, only four people had heard of Ibogaine, and only one of them actually really knew what it was, which is pretty bloody shocking. Next slide, please. Wow. Correct. Okay, right, okay. So what's next for us at high level? Um, to do justice to all the early help I got. And Bob, I'm glad you're here now because I wanted to express my gratitude to all the work that you put into me in those early years. And they really, they, they put me in great, great stead. I would like to be driving back to pushing for that 12 people pilot study. I'd like to try a way of getting a fundraiser. So this actually happens. This is very, very important. We want to investigate the viability of orphan drug status. We do know that there are far too many drug addicts, but perhaps we can focus on that little minute um, demographic of people who have tried everything and nothing else has worked. So maybe we can reduce the number of, um, of um, stats on that to allow us to become an orphan status drug. Also, to keep collecting data. As you know, we collect a lot of data. I want to keep doing that. I don't want any gaps in the system. I want to keep collecting data. And, um, yeah, I want to see less of this approach. I keep hearing about the vast, uncontrolled experiment. Well, let's put some control in it and call it the vast, controlled experiment. Let's put some systems in place as a community to actually see what's really going on, okay? So this is kind of what's next at a high level for me. And um, next slide, please. So um, this is really exciting because Ibogaine has got pretty close to a, I would say, center stage at the ICAD conference in May, which is Europe's leading addictions and associated disorders conference in London. So I think this is really the first time that Ibogaine is going to be showcased in a big addiction conference. So um, I think this is really, really important. This is a major, major step. We are hoping that Tom Kingsley Brown will be speaking. There'll be a question and answer session. We will have a stand there as well, so we'll be spreading the word. So this is really, really, really exciting. Yeah, next slide. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, just to finish off, really, um, you know, there's the issue of Portugal. You know, I often get approached, it must be really easy to do what you're doing because of the the decriminalization of drugs in Portugal. There is a uh, over-reliance here on um, opioid sub um, replacement therapies. Um, I won't bore you with a, with a long-winded story, but I have been in, in sitting with doctors who have absolutely slated the fact that we got something that could actually solve this problem of over-prescriptions of ORTs. And um, I'm a big believer that I began with conventional, conventional tried and tested therapies, holistic pre and post therapies, and more importantly, fellowship is a way forward. I think it's people are going out of treatment centers in isolation. They really need some guidance and help and support. This is really, really, really important. And, you know, I've written it here. I want to set the gold standard for Ibogaine treatments so that actually, you know, we can help people do what we're doing and keep bettering our offering and to reinvent rehabs as we know them today. So that's my mission. Thanks. Excellent, excellent, Alvaro. Well done. Uh, questions? Ginger. Anwar, please. <laughs> he is part of the program, actually, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the PowerPoint support. Thank you for letting me do it. I got to read and pay attention. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. Uh, really great to hear about incorporating the steps. Um, I had questions that I didn't want to ask because I was doing the PowerPoint, but there, you kind of didn't come back to the friends and the, or the parents part, the family aspect of it, and that's really been my experience is that uh, my first husband was treated in 2004 underground um, by two big providers early on in their practice, and I'm also indebted to Bob. Howard Lotsoff spent that weekend uh, counseling me over the phone, walking us through his treatment, and it was great to see his picture on the 
desktop. But what, what uh, do you think there's room for an online friends and family? That's my group. Al Anon's my oh, main qual qualifier. And is there any help we could give you well, doing that? I, I think there is room for an I began Al Anon. And uh, this is the whole point is um, how we can get people involved that will actually support the recovery process of the person undergoing I began treatment. You know, um, recovery is a family affair, as is addiction. So it makes perfect sense to get the family involved. And often the problem that we're faced with um, is enmeshment, lack of boundaries, um, you know, whether it's a tough love approach or not. I believe in giving love. I think it's more important than actually um, the tough love approach. But it's, it's where do you draw the line? And I think to bring in an Al-Anon for Ibogaine treatments would be amazing as well. So thanks for that. I have a follow-up question unless someone else wants to talk. I loved your idea of there being like a clinic tithe or a provider's tithe or a something, you know, uh, not that it's a tax, but that it's a contribution to supporting executive director of GIDA or, you know, whatever, whatever else needs to be done. Do you have any more ideas about that you could well, share? Well, um, yeah. So are you talking to Jeremy or to me? So I wasn't sure. To you. Oh, to me, yeah. Um, yeah, well, it's again, I didn't really touch on that too much because I didn't want to be overly controversial. But, um, you know, with, with um, let's face it, Ibogaine treatments can be lucrative. You know, I've sank a lot of money into this project, but it will eventually be lucrative. And I think it's essential that Ibogaine providers actually start putting some money where their mouth is and actually putting money into Gita's pot so they can keep doing the work that they've actually stopped doing. And, you know, it would not be fair for any of us in the community single-handedly, uh -huh. you know, like the earlier generation, to actually embark on undertaking these pilot studies and clinical trials. It makes sense to find a country or a site that is able to conduct credible pilot studies, for example, and actually have the community pay into that for the benefit of everybody. Um, I think it's absolutely vital. You know, I, I owe a lot to, to people like Bob. I owe a tremendous amount to Sarah Glatt, who's sitting in jail now. You know, we need to do something. We need to get together. And, you know, what's, what's $5,000 per head? You know, if they say there are 100 Ibogaine treatment providers, What's five thousand dollars? Put that in the Gita pot. Let's make some noise. It gives me great pleasure to invite Anders Beatty. And Ben Klein to the stage. So now for the power couple in pre and post Ibogaine treatment. Um, good afternoon. Well, let me introduce you. Yep. Uh, in fact, no, I won't. You carry on. Hi, um, my name is Anders Beatty. Um, it's a huge pleasure to be here, I see so many of my friends and colleagues here. Um, I'd like to start this off because I wouldn't be here if I didn't have an incredible Ibogaine treatment myself a few years back. Um, so I'd like to dedicate what we're doing to uh, Paul Featherston, um, who, without, without um, his incredible pre-treatment for me, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. Everything that I began counseling services is about has a rich vein of Paul Featherston running through it. Um, it's a shame he couldn't be here. Um, and now I'll get on with, with what we do. Um, I suppose what we do is help people use I began as a tool to become more connected and comfortable with who they are thereby removing the, the need to self-medicate. Um, this will enable them to modify the ways they live their life, 
and navigate the world. Um, this process isn't about drugs per se. I don't think it is at all. It's about connecting to one's true, authentic self. Connecting to that child which got lost many, many years ago, who had been burdened by social, familial, and cultural conditioning so that they lost their true essence in some way or another. Um, if we can help our clients look at that particular darkness in their life and understand that they are actually victims, perhaps, of their conditioning, if they can see that, then they can start to disidentify themselves, uh, disassociate themselves from, from their addict self or, or their pain body, as Eckhart Tolle would call it, or their shadow self, as Jung would call it, or whatever. Um, the thing is, is when the clients start to live what Carl Rogers would call a good life, the need to self-medicate evaporates. Um, this is about... I began, for, for, for me, is the catalyst which allows people to connect to a good life, a different life. They don't have to be the person that they think they are because they've been told that by their parents or by their schooling or whatever. Um, I suppose the first thing I'd like to talk about is, as I said, you know, we're, we're hoping to awake our clients' curiosity about the unconscious processes uh, that drive their behaviours whilst they're using. And, and in doing that, we, we hope to inspire a sense of integrity. Um, we hope that all of our clients, when they arrive to um, the providers who we work with, um, they arrive there to a commitment of self-knowledge and self-actualization rather than mere detoxification. Um, and they're therefore in, you know, in a good state of mind to have a good outcome. I, I kind of look at um, Ibogaine treatment, as, you, as it often happens, it's like saying to somebody in February, here's a boat, you're on the west coast of Ireland, get across the Atlantic to Newfoundland. And what we hope to do with our clients is at least give them the tools to navigate the seas a little bit better, to be able to have a compass, see what the stars, you know, uh, have some waterproofs, have some tinned foods. The journey is still their own journey. It's still their rite of passage. But at I began Counseling Services, we hope to give them some more tools so that their journey isn't essentially a reactive one. You know, you do your Ibogaine, and then you're expected to react to life on life's terms, and it can be very difficult. We talk and we help our clients recognize their behaviors, their thinkings, um, how the family might influence them, the environmental factors behind their using. And we get them to consider this before they do the Ibogaine. Um, I think I'd like to hand over to Ben now. I'm feeling very, very nervous. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, hi, I'm Ben, for those of you who don't know me. Um, and to pick up on what Anders is saying, really our entire kind of reason for existing, Ibogaine Counseling Services' reason for existing, is to help people use Ibogaine as something to enable themselves to go through a rite of passage. Um, and I think that's something which in Western culture um, is completely misunderstood and in many cases doesn't exist. And so I'll talk probably later on in this presentation a bit more um, about what rites of passage is what a rite of passage really is um, from an anthropological perspective. Um, my background is in anthropology, but um, on a kind of top line level, essentially what a rite of passage does is it, it's a transformation of the psyche. It's a transformation of your identity. It's a transformation of the way you understand yourself and your place in the world. And that I think is the root of so much mental illness in our in our culture, whether it's addiction or depression. We feel isolated, we feel like we don't belong, we don't know who we are essentially. Um, so our work is all about helping people to actually learn to distinguish between the different voices in their head and to change their relationship with those voices. Uh, so essentially what they're able to do is to release themselves from the conditioned narrative they have about themselves 
which underlies their self-sabotaging behavior. Um, and that essentially is what a rite of passage is. And um, Anders is talking about doing this proactively rather than reactively, and the reason why we believe that's completely essential is because if you look at any uh, indigenous shamanic community, whatever, however you want to call it, any, any culture that uses uh, plant teachers, visionary plants uh, for spiritual and mental healing, no one in those communities is ever even allowed to go near these substances without having first gone through the ritual preparation, which often is, uh, it, it, it's, it's a lifetime of preparation. Often you start from birth, you are start, your education begins on how to navigate your psychedelic experience in order to, to discover, in order to arrive at your true self. Um, and so what we do, um, to give a little bit of more kind of substance to, to what we're talking about, is we will, mm -hmm. in the period before a, a client's Ibogaine treatment, we will help them to, to examine and explore the, the kind of reservoir of subconscious pain, um, which Eckhart Tolle would call the pain body, uh, which basically defines their behavior patterns. Um, and to really be able to see how uh, that, that pain body is held in place by a scaffolding of conditioned narratives. You know, things that we're told that we are, things that we're told that we have to be, ideas that we pick up about ourselves. Um, and this is what creates the voice in your head, basically telling you, uh, you know, you're not good enough, you're a piece of shit, you need to be doing this, you need to be doing that, you're not impressive enough. What creates the need to self-medicate? Um, and by helping people to understand that their recovery is not about drugs. You know, the Ibogaine, yeah, it's a detox, sure. But this entire process is actually a rite of passage in the sense that uh, it's, it's uh, very much in line with the Buddhist idea of know thyself. You know, it, it's, it's about them coming to understand that what they've always believed they are is not true. And they can actually define, they can actually connect to something much more authentic about themselves. And when they understand that this is actually what the process of recovery, of recovering is about, then their intentionality is, is, is correct. It, essentially, they realize that, um, you know, it's about them learning who they really are and connecting to their authentic self, and only they can do that for themselves. We don't, we can't do that for them. Ibogaine can't do that for them, you know. So they arrive at their treatment having gone through this process of connecting to a responsibility to themselves, to understanding um, who they are, um, and in that sense, removing the need to self-medicate. Um, I think, Anders, I'll hand back to you to elaborate. Yeah. I mean, I, I suppose in many ways, um, we, we, we tend to try and do six or seven sessions beforehand with our clients, and. The first thing we look at, and I think this is really important, and our clients have to understand, that Ibogaine is not a magic cure. So many people go into the Ibogaine experience, um, you know, they expect to go in on a Friday, they've done no preparation, they turn up, they do their Ibogaine, and then they think that by next Wednesday, they're going to be new person, you know, that they're going to be morphed into an all-loving, all-amazing, as good-looking as George Clooney sort of substitute of some type. And it just doesn't happen in that way. Um, you know, it requires a lot more work than that. So our first thing we, we like to achieve is to, to help the client understand that it is a right of passage. This is the most important thing. But it requires work. It, it requires intentionality. It requires integrity. It requires self-respect and reverence. Um, we're talking about people who have their feet firmly in a world of self-hate, where they have narratives about their lives which are, you know, appalling. You know, they talk to themselves in a, in a really, really horrendous way. Um, and so we, if we can look at those very narratives which they talk to themselves with, sorry, um, <laughs> um, if we can look at those very narratives which people talk to themselves about um, 
and we can show them that it's not their own true authentic narratives. It's being given to them by mum or dad or the bullies in the playground at school, but it's normally attached to some type of childhood trauma. Often they get a real sense of relief. They start the process of disidi disidentifying from, from their addict self. You know, there is a real me. There is an authentic me somewhere down there. And that's the first step to connecting to the authentic self. Um, so where are we? We're, we're talking about that's the first step, yeah. As I said before, you know, if, if the clients can make session and they can do the things and they can start observing themselves and they can start thinking about what brought them into addiction, um, how they came into addiction, what their thinking is which keeps them in addiction, if we can give them some sort of mindfulness around that, then we're cracking them open for the Ibogaine experience. And I think this is a very, very important thing. As it exists at the moment, people just turn up for Ibogaine at the experience and they hold on for dear life with most, with most clinics and, uh, and the like. What we're offering is a chance to crack open the client ever so slightly so the Ibogaine will work in a different way. And then when they get out of the experience, they can run with it. We take them out of the world of self-hate, which they've been in for a very, very long time. They have one foot put into their potentiality. They take the eye brigade, and hopefully they can lift that other foot out and start running with it. And yeah, you need support. You need to be, um, you, need, you need the right people around. You need the people to understand that. But we, we hope that we can start this process for them. Um, can I go? Yeah. yeah um, what I think is really, really uh, interesting and really important about this is, you know, obviously you can look at what we do. We're working with Ibogaine. We're treating addicts. We live in the, the modern Western world, and you say there's nothing, there's nothing even remotely similar to, say, uh, uh, you know, people using iboga, whether they're buiti or, or you know, people using other plant medicines in the Amazon, in the kind of indigenous context. And actually, what we're trying to do is is actually very similar because if you look at is where I'm going to go a little bit in a little bit deeper into anthropology here. You look at uh, what is a rite of passage um, in the communities that have become expert at actually delivering rites of passage for their community members. Um, it's essentially um, it's about enabling people to see their real identity as a link in an ancestral chain, realizing that what you are, what you think you are. You know, okay, I'm Ben. I, I have this job, I went to this school, I hold this degree, all of that stuff is basically bullshit. Really what you are is you are the current embodiment of all of your ancestors. You only exist because the whole universe has been going for 13 billion years to enable these atoms that are in your body now to have this form. You, you carry the flame of your ancestors, right? You're a link in a chain. You need that chain in order to exist. That chain also needs you in order to proliferate into the future. That's your real identity, right? And um, that's essentially like the Buiti philosophy behind doing Iboga, to connect to the ancestors, to continue the work of the ancestors, um, to actually start living your real identity. And people stray from that chain. So people stray from that identity. They lose sight of who they are and what they are. They get bogged down in you know, the, the more mundane aspects of life, financial struggles, relationship problems, social status, all of these things. And rites of passage are extremely, extremely clever things. They break down those beliefs. And they do this in almost every indigenous culture in the same way. You know, the, the rituals and the symbolism changes. Um, but there are three basically um, ubiquitous phases of a rite of passage that exist everywhere. The first is the separation. This is when you spend a period of time um, living outside of your normal identity. And this can be enforced in a number of ways in all kinds of different communities. In some, you may have to wear white for a period of several months. So it's like you're not able to wear the same clothes as, as your normal uh, role or status would demand. In some cases, you're, you're not called by your name for a period of time. Sometimes it's more extreme. You even have to go and live in the forest alone for a period of time. Basically, the point is to get you to experience the reality and the truth underneath all of your conditioning, which is that you're none of the things that actually you have come to believe that you are. And by experiencing that for a period of time, um, you actually get released from the stranglehold of the, of the nagging voice in your head, 
which is, is all based on your, on your conditioned uh, sense of self, right? So you, you go through this period of separation. Then, as a result of that, you enter into the phase called liminality, which is when you're nothing. You're basically, you're no longer you. You no longer have an identity. You no longer have a job. You no longer have a name. You no longer have a role. You have nothing. You're basically creation. You're the universe. You're, you're, just, you're just infinite potentialities, right? And then, that's when you're allowed to take your iboga or your ayahuasca or your peyote or your psilocybin or your fly agaric or whatever it is once you're in that state of really understanding that you are not what you thought you are. And that's when you have your amazing breakthrough and you connect to the, to the real you. So the difference between what we do and what would happen traditionally is normally the entire community would come together to create this experience. You know, you do this um, in the presence of your whole village, you know, so then the phases that you go through, the phases that your father went through and your grandfather or your mother and your grandmother and whoever, right? So it's, it's a communal thing. What we're trying to do is, is help people to see themselves how they're on that same trajectory, they're on that same path, except it's basically just two blokes from London um, <laughs> kind of trying to guide you through it yeah. rather than, you know, a whole village full of elders. And that's why it's, it's such a challenge for us. But the, the philosophy behind what we're doing is based entirely on that. So it's really not so different. The only, the only difference is we don't have the village infrastructure that we need. I, th I think one of the things what we try to do is help help our clients reframe their narratives, uh, their life narratives, their personal narratives. Um, and, and we have a number of ways we do that. One, as I've said before, we look at the narratives. We look at what Carl Rogers would call the good life. Um, you know, people seem to define themselves by sort of very sort of pithy and simple adjectives like I, I'm good, I'm fine, I need to be rich or whatever. And we, we think life is more about enrichment, reward and education. So in many ways, we're trying to get the clients to look at the bigger picture, what's more important. Um, you know, we have a few tricks that we use to help the clients get into the right mindset to have their Ibogaine treatment. One of the things that we always insist our client does through, through the sessions we do them is, is a letter from either themselves to their addiction or from their addiction to themselves, which they can burn at the providers. And it kind of provides a seamless way of working, handing over the client to the provider. Um, and it puts the, pu puts the client in the right headspace. Um, we look at the idea that the clients are, are essentially warriors, that they're, you know, they're, they're brave and they're amazing and they've been chosen to do the cyber game. And I really do believe that in many ways as well. Um, and so we connect to that sort of warrior spirit within the client, which again makes them feel important. You've got to remember, most of our clients have been told that they're burdens, they're pieces of shit, they're junkies, they're useless. This is even our cultural narrative. We treat people in addiction who are essentially, they're broken children. These are, these are children which weren't allowed to develop into the natural, normal, authentic adults they wanted to be. This is why they're in addiction, no other reason. They haven't been able to express themselves honestly. Um, and so we help with that process. We hope to allow them to I suppose, come to the family table and introduce that lost child to the other aspects of their personality. That's what we try to help do our clients, to help our clients with through the Ibogaine experience. It is a hero's journey. I believe that anybody who does Ibogaine, you know, it's a ballsy thing to do. You know, you go online and you read about Ibogaine, it's terrifying. It really is. It's really, really terrifying. And, you know, you've got to wonder how you know, what type of people write the type of things they do about Ibogaine online because it's so far removed from the truth and the reality. People always tend to talk about, you read about Ibogaine, nobody ever talks about what they did beforehand. They never talk about what they did after. They never talk about the aspects of their recovery, but they tell you about this journey they've had. That's not important. The journey that journey with Ibogaine, that 24 hours with Ibogaine is not the important part. It is a catalyst. It does help you. But it's about connecting to what Carl Rogers calls the good life. Becoming who you can be. On becoming a person. 
This is what the IB game journey is about. This is what the catalyst is. Um, that's it. Is that the end of it? That's it. That's it. Sorry. <laughs> um, no, I don't know. I'm not sure yet. I don't know if Ben's got anything to say. <laughs> um, I mean, one of the ways we look at it, we, there's something we like to call the metaphorical cooking pot. And I think this is a very, very important part of the process for our clients, is that we introduce them to the fact that they are manifestations of other people's conditioning. That's why they're lost, and that's why they're in addiction. Um, and what we like to <laughs> offer to our clients is maybe alternative ways of thinking and looking at life, different philosophies, different psychotherapies. We believe that the client can educate themselves very much. And we suggest to our clients, well, you know, we might say, have a look at a bit of Alan Watts here or, or a bit of Joseph Campbell there or maybe a bit of Eckhart Tolle there. And whatever feels right to you, whatever feels good in your gut, put that into your metaphorical cooking pot. And if you think, oh, fucking hell, Anders has sent me a load of crap. I don't like it. I'm getting angry. Then that's probably your addict side saying, hmm, let's self-sabotage right here, right now with that. So we introduce the client to the fact that they self-sabotage all the time. It's an automatic response for most of our clients. It's their default setting through years and years of conditioning. So it's very, very exciting for them to actually first see that they are not their thinking often, that their negative thinking is not really them. So they put different ingredients into their cooking pot, their metaphorical cooking pot of what feels right to them, what stories, what analogies, what narratives feel good for them, what feels good right here. And then after two to three weeks of working with us, suddenly they've got this wonderful recipe which they've created on their own. And they begin to get a sense of who they are. And, you know, one of the most important things is don't let anyone else put an ingredient into that cooking pot. Don't let your mum and dad come in and say something, put an ingredient that you're useless or you're a waste of space or you're not good enough. Because that is not the truth. Um, and I suppose this is how we try and set our clients up for the Ibogaine experience. So they don't go in in the headspace that they're a pile of shit. Because that's what they've been told by everybody. You're a junkie, you're useless, you need to pull your socks up. Why are you here? Why are you doing that? I think that you should. Deadly. All of these massive shame narratives. And shame is the number one food that keeps people in addiction. Their pain body loves shame more than anything else. If you want somebody to relapse, shame them. Mind you, if they've done the work with us, they realise what's going on. But <laughs> um. Yeah, but I, I think to, to pick up on that, uh, that, what we're trying to get at is that we also don't like to be um, seen as kind of therapists because essentially what we're trying to do is, is help people to sort of become their own therapist in a way. It's about, you know, we can't tell you who you are. You know, and I think that's another paradigm that we have to try and break is people come to you as a counselor or a therapist and they have this assumption because of our, our kind of medical tradition that you know, this, this therapist is kind of gonna tell me what to do, is gonna kind of give me some answers. And our entire job really is to get, just, just to get people to understand that only you have your own answers, you know, and we just try and encourage that. And it's kind of this, this first, um, kind of foray into taking responsibility for who you want to be, you know, you yourself, um, is um, is the first step towards recovery. Um, that's really what, because recovery isn't about abstinence. You know, yeah, you can be abstinent and you can hold on with white knuckles for the rest of your life and make it to your deathbed saying, yes, I never touched heroin again or I never had another drink. But every day was a struggle and it was a misery and it was such hard work. Um, that's not recovery, in our opinion. You know, that's just abstinence, which is no no fun. Actually, recovery um, is not. It it it's enjoyable. It's fun. It's it's not serious. We're helping people to actually become less serious. That's kind of a major um, aim of what we do. You know, it's about actually allowing yourself to be vulnerable, allowing yourself to 
open up to the experience of life, you know, with all its ups and downs, without shaming yourself or becoming traumatized by things that don't go your way or without, you know, holding on too tightly to the things that do go your way. It's about just being a human and accepting the reality of who and what you are, which is perfect, you know, and regardless of, of what may be happening to you. Um, and this is the thing we've lost our connection to, mm. the, the value in being alive, being a human being, having been created by the universe. I mean, I tell myself that every day, like, you know, the universe, there was a big bang billions of years ago and I'm, you know, the product of that. You know, all of this happened just kind of for me and for you and for all of us. And I'm like, wow, you know, I'm actually pretty fucking cool regardless of what anyone <laughs> tells me. Yeah. And so, you know, that's the kind of the mindset that people have lost and that's what creates so much anxiety and, and imbalance. And it really, it's, it's all about that. And we can't give that to anyone. And I don't really think um, Iboga alone or any entheogen alone can give that, but it's um, it's part of the way back to that. Yeah, I, I think you know, uh, connecting to the good life rather than using the word recovery, but connecting to the good life is about learning to parent yourself, being good to yourself, loving yourself, caring for yourself, enjoying life, um, having having you know, suddenly realizing that whatever happens to you in life, how traumatic it is, either you can be you can decide to be traumatized by events in your life, or you can decide to be educated and enriched by them. That's what the Ibogaine journey is about, is changing you from a victim into somebody who takes on life and life's terms, and you parent yourself, and you care for yourself, and you love yourself properly. And when you're in addiction, you hate yourself. No two ways about it. That's why you're sticking drugs and needles in your arm every day, because you hate yourself. The Ibogaine journey for us is just part of a process to self-love. It really is that corny, really that simple. Um, and it's a hell of a journey. It's really good for... You know, I, 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 I suppose I'll be finishing here. I don't know about Ben, but... Maybe I we should have actually written this. I, yeah, maybe... <laughs> I've got to say, I'm very, very, very grateful for my addiction because if it hadn't been for my addiction, I wouldn't have arrived where I am at today. It's been the vehicle to bring me to a place where I actually feel very, very, very comfortable in myself and very comfortable with the people around me. And I don't think that would have ever, ever happened if I hadn't gone through the pain of addiction. Um, so in many ways, addiction can be, can be considered a friend, believe it or not. Um, if you're willing to reframe the narratives. Um, and that is what we try to help our clients do just before they do Ibogaine, is to start reframing the narrative, start seeing themselves in a slightly different way, not seeing themselves as the victims the whole time, not seeing themselves as a piece of shit, which they've been told by everybody they are. Yeah, I think maybe it's th maybe it's a good idea to talk a little bit about the integration and aftercare as well as the as the preparation. Our um, approach to aftercare and integration um, is probably a little bit different to kind of what most people would have because what we've come to believe through our experience um, is that. The, without the pre-care, the integration often is, as Anders was saying, it becomes reactive rather than proactive. You know, the, if you haven't gone through, like I was saying when I was talking about the, the kind of traditional cultures that use these plant medicines, if you haven't gone through the, the, the first step of separation from the false self-image that you had before, um, then you've missed out basically the foundation of what your integration is going to be based on. Um, if you haven't actually become conscious of what you thought you were and why that was actually keeping you locked in certain patterns of behavior, um, you've missed out basically a, a huge chunk of, of what needs to go into your integration. If you have had that, your integration occurs at a point when you have released yourself from your, from your false and negative self-image. You've um, discovered or you're beginning to discover your way back to the reality of who you are, your authentic self. So your integration is basically you've, you've already seen the path and your integration is just about walking that path yeah. now. Um, it's about living. You've seen your, your kind of 
authentic you and it's just about living it. So our approach to integration is about removing all the obstacles that would stop you from continuing that path. So for example, and ov th often this has to be done uh, preemptively as well. For example, we don't want people doing Ibogaine, returning home to the same um, stresses and crises that they had before, because all of that stuff is gonna make it really hard to not slip back into that old mindset. So if, let's say you have um, financial debts, you have family problems, you know, anything, y y your, your apartment is a complete mess and it's just, you, it triggers you because you associate it with using and, and uh, with depressive thinking. We look at that beforehand. We get people to understand how all the things in their environment are contributing to their sense of self, to their, to their internal narrative about who they are. Get them to understand why this all needs to be removed if you want to actually be free to, to continue along your path, along your true path. So we will help people in the months before their Ibogaine to eliminate the possibility of returning home to a shitstorm. You know, so if that means working with um, family members or helping them with their finances, helping them move apartment, any of that stuff, it's got to be done, or at least um, the work has to have been started before you go for treatment. If you try and if you go for ibogaine treatment and think you can just go home to the same old shit and that you're just going to be immune to it all, having never um, started to deal with it beforehand you're gonna get overwhelmed, you, you just are, and, and it's all gonna, and that's why so many people, they, they, they feel amazing in, you know, after their Ibogaine, they have the afterglow period, you know, where you've got all the nor Ibogaine that's, you know, flowing through you, and your serotonin levels are wonderful, and, and everything's great, but that's just like a, a, a blanket that's gonna wear off, and, and the real world is gonna kick back in, yeah. and you're not gonna have the tools to actually, um, to, to not let it crush you unless you've kind of done this work. So, yeah, yeah that's our approach to You know, there's there, there could be nothing worse than going and having an Ibogaine treatment and coming back to uh, um, thousands and thousands of pounds of bills and debts. Um, we've had this with clients before and we learned quickly, but they start dealing again normally very, very quickly if they've got big debts like that. If they have an incredible journey and they walk through the house and the first thing they see is the table that they've been using on for the last 20 years. Well, you know, we need to do the work. We need to get rid of that piece of furniture which they've been using on. We need to change the environment. We need to talk to them about the people they hang out with. We need to talk to them about lying in bed all day long. You know, it's the small things. We encourage our clients on the first session more often than not just to start simply by making their bed every day. I mean, it's a huge thing for people in addiction to start doing that. But these are small acts of self-love which can change the client for the better. And when they have the Ibogaine journey, they feel that they've put respect and reverence and intentionality and integrity into the journey beforehand. And if they feel that they've done that, more often than not, I think this is a very salient point, you know, as much respect and reverence that you put in the journey is what you're going to get back from Ibogaine every time. The more work you do beforehand, the more you will be rewarded by, by the process. Done. Done. <laughs> Superb stuff, guys. Really good. Any questions? Um, yeah, wait, wait, wait. No, you just love oh, I see. Well, thanks, thanks for the talk, mm -hmm. guys. I, I think it's always very, very beneficial for the, the patients to have uh, services like yours. I really see the, the difference and the, the impact it, it has, you know. If you have a deep experience without integration, understanding of uh, what I, <laughs> what you can do, what can you do with it, right? Uh, they get lost. And you spoke about identity and understanding their place in society. Uh, you know, coming from a, a non-substance addict that might have had some some other issues to face in life. I found that entheogens, if you really pay attention to your journey, 
And if you get lucky and you have the right people around you to guide you through the experience and integrate it, then it really brings up, a, it might bring up a lot of maturity. And, and I think that's what's lacking to most people, you know, they, they, their mat maturation process gets cut off somewhere in life, you know, it might be childhood, teenagehood, early adulthood, and you don't uh, become your true adult self, you know, you, you don't rise up to the, the best version of yourself, and I, I think that's what happens with most people, like most people in society, but they just don't manifest that with drug abuse, but, you know, depression, whatever, you know, frustration, and I think this can be extended to other people, you know, that this, uh, you know, uh, rite of passage is, Unless you become a compassionate, you know, uh, almost perfect uh, being, you know, uh, just ser living in service towards others, I, I think you're still lacking some inside work. Yeah. yeah, because I think ultimately, you know, what you guys talked about in these uh, uh, societies, I think people, after they do a, you know, a good rite of passage, they become focused towards what's their place in society, how to serve society. And I, I, I think if you don't find that desire within yourself to contribute, then I think something is lacking. That's why you're still addressing your own needs. It feels selfish. It's because you, you are too hurt to be able to manage yourself and still give to others. You, you're not have, yeah. So what's your comment on that? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, human beings are mammals, obviously, and, and all mammals have the mammalian brain, which is kind of the emotional and... and um, um, the connectivity and relationship part of the brain. And we have this actual innate urge to form societies, to support each other. And actually, that is what gives us the biggest sense of well-being. Um, the problem is, as you said, people grow up and they don't really, y your, your psyche hits a stumbling block, right? You hit, a, you hit a complete roadblock and you don't really develop into what you're supposed to be. And so you end up um, just hurting yourself, you know, you end up getting stuck in these cycles of self-sabotage. And like, like you say, in a rite of passage, essentially what, it, what a rite of passage means is overcoming the stumbling block, moving on to the next level of development, um, which, yeah, again, like you said, our, our society doesn't really provide us with. Um, and as I was talking about, you know, there are a lot of other cultures that do, that have thousands of years of, or hundreds, or in some cases, thousands of years of experience of providing these rites of passages which actually are extremely clever and they actually do help people to move their psyche onto the next level you know and they transform your identity and and in all cases what it leads you to is it leads you away from selfishness it leads you into this sense of belonging with your community and your your whole life your choices become about um um, becoming a, a source of strength and love and support for your community rather than yourself. And then you tend to feel damn good about yourself, you know. Whereas addiction obviously is the opposite. It's, it's <coughs> very self-focused. Yeah. Oh. <coughs> Anders. <laughs> yeah, hi. <laughs> um, yeah, um, it's, it's a known fact that many of uh, uh, the caregivers in the Ibogaine community are f were formerly addicted. And um, you know, what are your thoughts on the sort of message that caregivers like ourselves are giving? Because you know, we're working in the business of care. We're actually living Ibogaine therapy. Mm. And you know, we, we, it's really about the example that we give out to people looking for treatments, like your lever yeah. to actually delay treatment for someone. You know, it's, it's really easy for, well, it's not easy, but people in the community like ourselves that work in this, it's easier to stay clean because we're working in this industry. Absolutely. But for people that come and do Ibogaine and go back home, you know, it's kind of what would the message be to providers to actually either delay treatment or help set them up for ongoing therapy? I mean, we, we, we do have a red flag system, and if we feel in some way, and we were talking about intuition earlier, as, uh, very much so, but you, you kind of get, you kind of know that when a client's coming along and they just want a quick fix and they want to blindside everybody and, and come in and, and in one way or another, and, and we have a red flag system, and we find that if clients don't turn up to session or they're late or um, 
well, a whole host of kind of problems within session, it, it kind of brings up a red flag. And, and we are willing to work with the providers to often delay treatment and in some cases suspend treatment. I mean, last two years ago, we had one particular client who was incredibly aggressive and incredibly difficult. And I, I told the provider at the time, I said, well, you, my own personal feeling is you don't want to work with this guy because if you do, it's going to go wrong. He's not going to get better. And then he's going to look for somebody to blame and it will be you, the provider. And as sure as hell, he went to another provider. It didn't work. And actually, I think um, you bought the name of that particular company. Um, and it's, uh, it's cost you, actually, at the end of the day. Uh, I beg a tree. I beg a tree. Um, where, where this client wrote a particularly, particularly derogatory uh, comment about his, his treatment there. But he wasn't a viable candidate for ca uh, Ibogaine to begin with. I really, really do believe that. I think and there's an also you know, this idea that a lot of clients do come on and they do look for the quick fix. They do look for the quick cure. Our job is to stop them. Our job is to tell them it's not a quick fix. It's not a quick cure. It is a rite of passage. You need to love yourself a bit more, have a little bit more self-respect, have, have a multi-dimensional perspective. Think about the people who are providing you the treatment. Think about your family. Think about yourself. It goes way beyond just the individual. I don't know what your question was, Alvera. I've got... Starting to wonder, it was more the fact that a lot of us caregivers are in recovery, yeah. and it's easier for us to have had the Ibogaine experience and actually be in recovery because we're living the Ibogaine story, yeah. so to speak, the success story, we hope. And it's really the, me the message that we as providers should be giving to, to patients uh, because, yeah. you know... We're kind of living it and doing it. I, I think the message I is really is to define what is... I, I can translate it. I think it's about... He's asking about, look, there's fellowship, or there should be fellowship among Ibogaine providers. What message about fellowship does that convey to clients? Something like that? Well, yeah, about um, you know, the, the message that we're, if we're living yeah. Ibogaine treatment, it's a lot easier for us. Ah, to be more to compassionate. <laughs> Be more compassionate and actually passing on that knowledge. It's not just about the treatment recommendation. No, 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 not at all. I mean, the, 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 whole, the whole process is about connecting to what one could call the good life and what that is for the individual clients. And they have to have ownership of that. And they have to be willing to discover what the good life is for them and not to be... And, and, you know, to go out there and try things. And, you know, the thing is, is when you're an addiction and you try something and you fail at it, that's a bloody good excuse to use some more. We're hoping that our clients will have the mindset, I've tried it, I don't like it, great, let's try something else. Because that's about living life a bit more. Um, so it's being far more gentle on yourself, having some fun with your recovery, um, being nice to yourself, enjoying the people that you love, enjoying your friends, not isolating, being aware of your your bad wolf or your pain body, because as sure as hell it will always come up. Um, you know, before I was doing this lecture here today, um, you know, my 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 sort of bad wolf and my pain body was saying, oh God, you're going to be in front of there, you're going to be useless, you're not good enough, you're a fraud, you shouldn't be here, you've got nothing salient to say. And you know, in the old days, when that voice cropped up for me, I would go out and use. Now I see it and I go, aha, you're here, you're back again, okay. But that is part of me now, and I can live with that, and it's part of me which I enjoy. And this is what good recovery is about. It's, it's bringing in the light and darkness and being able to integrate the two together and, and having just bloody well enjoying life now. So, oh. Can you hear me? Well, it's in a response to this conversation just because I feel like it's just not complete. Because, uh, uh, Alvaro, you were saying passing on the Ibogaine story, passing on the good life to our clients. <coughs> uh, and um, uh, I, from my perspective, uh, a great deal of the work that we do is passing on our shitty, difficult, challenging lives onto other people and connecting with them on that peer level and that we don't stop dealing with substance issues. I don't know what uh, living the Ibogaine story is, so if you can expand on that, perhaps 
in your next talk or whatever, but I, I, living the Ibogaine story is very complex, and it has a lot of up and ups and downs. Just being a, a drug user is incredibly co complex, and for me, I found that the way for me and some of my closest colleagues to connect with clients before, if they decide to become, or after, and during especially, is when we demonstrate our weaknesses, because they see them anyway. They're taking Ibogaine. And if we don't get honest about that, and our own challenges, and what we're dealing with, like An Anders just mentioned, he didn't want to fucking get up this morning and get be in front of everybody, you know? Getting more honest about that, and telling our clients that, hey, I, I'm, I'm anxious right now, too. I want a benzo right now, too. And getting honest about that, I think, is really crucial in this idea of passing on the good life to me. I'm sorry, excuse me, I just don't understand what that is. Well, I mean, oh, sorry. I mean, it, it's not passing on the good life. It's, it's allowing the client to attach to their own version of what the good life is. And the, and the good life is about enrichment, it is about reward, it is about challenges. It is about accepting the light with the dark. It's about being able good to... Life includes it all. It includes it all. It, it's not about being good life it's about having a fulfilling enriching amazing life because in the words of my great friend jeremy here you know we are pupil when you know it's funny but when we recognize as addicts that we are essentially pupils in earth school that we've come down here and we've got a little period of time here and actually we're on this beautiful spinning planet which is a school when we recognize that we are pupils here then we can reframe every single narrative, however traumatic it is, into something enriching, into something beautiful, and into something amazing and, and educative. And that's why I enjoy my life at the moment, because whatever comes my way, and I have some really shitty days, I don't have to be traumatized by it anymore. And that is fucking brilliant, to live that life. That's the good life. Two more questions. One and one. Oh, Hadi was first, sorry. My bad. My bad. <laughs> Well, we, um, that's one thing that we've been kind of um, tweaking and, and kind of working our way towards actually figuring out like the right number of sessions. And, and really, you know, it does vary from client to client because obviously everyone has their own unique baggage and things they've got to deal with. So it's kind of hard to say to have like an off the shelf package. Um, we kind of, um, it, you know, it really varies. You get some people who are very functional, like, what, what people call functional addicts, and then you get more kind of, you know, what people would call a junkie. And yeah, more often than not, the more functional a person is, often the less sessions will be involved. Um, we kind of, what we do is we ask people to make a commitment to six sessions to start with. And um, that's pre. That's pre, no. that's pre yeah. yeah. And we will, we will talk about them about pricing. We'll, we're flexible on our pricing. Um, we have a, a price that we, um, for those who can afford it, that we like to ask for, but for those who can't afford it, we, we bring it down. Um, and so, we, yeah, we try, uh, obviously, yeah, the, the financing is always going to be an issue, but we try and make it as affordable as possible. I think, I think one of the important things is that we always insist that the client pays pre-treatment. They've got to put value on what we do and what they're doing. But we've had examples of clients who've gone in, had an Ibogaine treatment, they're no longer dealing or they're no longer on the game or they're no longer engaging in criminality and they can't afford sessions. Well, we're not going to drop a client post Ibogaine because they don't have the money. That would be awful to do that. But if they don't got the money before treatment and they can afford a healthy habit, you know, 
It's a different sort of deal. So, um, you know, where, where's the respect and reverence for their journey if they can afford to, to have a three gram habit a day, but they can't afford to pay us for, for one hour a week? I think it's, uh, yeah. And, you know, that's the great thing. So this is kind of our red flag system working. You know, we can turn around to the provider and go, Christ, they don't even want to pay for one session beforehand. Are they really ready for it? Do they really want to go for it? Are they really serious about their recovery? I mean, these are questions we ask. We're not saying, we're not labeling like that, but suddenly they, you know, you start kind of wondering what, what, I mean, uh, we, we do have, I mean, I don't know if you, there is an ex-client of ours who, who came along today. He had treatment two months ago. Uh, it's been very successful. He had a really, really, really rough ride, really difficult. Um, um, and, you know, if you, if you want to talk to him, it's a guy called Andrew over there. If you want to talk to him, uh, please feel, or, or he could say something, I don't know. Yeah, are you going to come say a few words, Andrew? Andrew Laws. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> yeah. I feel a bit intimidated here. Yeah, I was in addiction for 35 years. Um, High-functioning addict, um, veteran. Um, met Anders through my provider. I, I, I got on methadone. I ended up, ended up on methadone on a script I wasn't using. I, I stuck to my script. Um, I just, the day I got on methadone, I cried my eyes out because I knew that was the end of the line for my addiction. And I started a contact provider. I spoke to Alvero, a few others um, in the room. Um, and then I was put in touch with Anders. And um, uh, we did three months, yeah. three months pre-therapy. And we, within two weeks, we were reframing the narratives good wolf, bad wolf coming up, loving who I was as a person. Um, thought I had it all cracked. We'd, we'd done so much work. Went provider, did the eye again, and Jesus Christ, what an experience I had. The, the visionary phase was great, but the, the cognitive phase, I really, really struggled. I was confronted with all my bad behavior, all my addict self, and it was only because of that pre-treatment that kept me going. Otherwise, I would be using. It, it got to the point where I was begging, begging to have people put back on methadone. Um, and Claire, you, you, I mean, you helped me. You spent time on the phone and got my head sorted out. And everybody, the whole community wrapped around. I thought I, I was having severe panic attacks. Um, so I thought I was having a heart attack. I, Ken Alper, he was on the phone, you know. I, I was confronted with everything why I used. And... Uh, I didn't sleep for 14 days, um, it, it was, but then the second month it, it's got better and better and attached to the good life and when that bad shit comes up I love it, I play with it, I laugh with it and I've attached to the good life, the good life for me is, is meditation, being in touch with who I am now, not running away and using and sticking needles in myself or smoking crack and I was a poly drug user, I was on 800 mils of Syracuse a day, 900 milligrams of Lyrica, 30 milligrams of methadone, heroin, cocaine, crack cocaine, benzos. You know, I, this, that, that was just a daily intake for me. That was, that was normal. I didn't even think twice about that. And, um, yeah, what these guys did for me and the, the, the post-therapy was still doing it and integrating it. I, mean, I live in a wonderful place. I'm not in the city that I used and I've never used in my house. Um, I live in a little beautiful flat right beside the beach. I can walk along the beach every day and just... I, I, I learned very quickly post dive again that life's about the journey, not the destination, and the destination is the journey. And that was thanks to these guys. And then uh, even, even, even in the run-up to treatment, I was getting carried away with myself. Right, I'm going to do all I began, and then I'm going to go and do ayahuasca. So I phoned Ben, and Ben was Andy. Concentrate on your eye again first. Get this out of the way. You know, it really grounded me. And and and, and again taught me grounding. That all I wanted to do post eye began was take my socks and shoes off and run outside and connect to Earth School. 
and be, be a pupil of this earth, and that's all I am. And Thanks, guys. Yeah. Uh, this is a perfect example because we, we haven't done the work. A a Andrew's done it for himself. That's the thing. And he's got through these incredible obstacles. And he, he had a really, really tough time post Ibogaine. It was, it was tough for him. But he didn't pick up. He didn't use. He is where he is. He's only been two months clean. It's a... Uh, no, you're looking good, man. Looking good. So... Yeah. Uh, Yeah, no, I agree with that. Yeah, well, I we mean, met, we met in London, didn't we? The, the, the day I went to South Africa to see him, and I was just in the world. I was dying. I was dying. And I well, um, you've done the work, mate. Well done. Oh, a tear came to my eye then. Any other questions? Doug. Oh, sorry. And, Doug and then you. Um, um, okay, yeah, I'll start with the second part about uh, the importance of having had the Ibogaine experience. I think um, really what we've been what we've been discussing is the the outcome of the Ibogaine experience, and it it's not even about the Ibogaine. You can reach that point um, through many other means. It's about for us, it, it's about seeing yourself on a journey and taking your own journey. And when you really feel like you have ownership of your journey and you're connecting with your real self and you're living your true path, um, that's it. You know. And people get there through meditation. Some people get there through um, you know, other entheogens. People get there through whatever makes them feel connected to themselves. So, I mean, yeah, for us, we've both had the Ibogaine experience and, and that's kind of been a catalyst. So in our experience, it probably was fundamental in putting us kind of on this on this path i don't think it's necessarily that way i think you can i think you can be a person who has reached the same conclusion who has um come to the same understanding of themselves and who they are and what life is through other means and that person is also appropriate i think to to counsel someone on on that process because that's really the process that it is. It's not even really about the specifics of um, how you of of you know what what make what gets you there. Um, so yes and no, I guess <laughs> is the answer to that. Um, I think it's not. I wouldn't say it's a strict yes for sure. I think it's more about um, it's about enlightenment, you know. And there's many paths to enlightenment. Ibogaine is not the only one. Um, and I'm not trying to say like, oh, I'm enlightened. I'm I'm the Dalai Lama or anything, um, or any of our, or that any of us are. But I think it's just um, it's a commitment to walking that road, um, which doesn't have to involve ibogaine. And also, different clients will respond differently to different counselors. You know, some some people you um, will need more in common with, some people less. So it's kind of it's going to vary from person to person as well. Um, that's why this is so complex, really. Um, just like my answer has been. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll let Anders try and, try and <laughs> tidy it up. Um, 
yeah, um, wow. Um, you, you were talking about having the Ibogaine experience and, and the importance of that in what we do. Is, is, am, am I right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, th I think I think so. Yeah, I mean, you know, I suppose one of the ways that I connect very very well with my clients is the fact that I I, I was strung out for twenty years. You know, I, I I went through every sort of single process of addiction. You know, went through, God knows how many rehabs. God knows, you know, I've picked up enough white key rings to, to, <laughs> to tile a bathroom. <laughs> you know, um, I, I've changed relationships. I changed towns, countries, continents to run away from my addictive self. And actually, Ibogaine was the thing that provided me with the platform to get better. So for that, I'm incredibly grateful. I, I, I think if you've, certainly it helps to have been an addict massively, and it's helped to have done Ibogaine massively. Okay. That's the only answer I can give you, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm uh -oh. concerned, yeah. <laughs> because oh, I had a lot of questions to ask you, but I can see you looking very anxious the moment I got all of the mic. Uh, yeah, well, you know. I just need to know. Um, it, was a <laughs> it was a great narrative. <laughs> Thank and you. I'd like to ask you the question how many times you used the word narrative in the talk? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're showing me very, very, very little respect and reverence there, Anwar. <laughs> Sorry, I, th that's our words. Narrative, respect, reverence, intentionality, and integrity are our main words within our treatment protocol. And all we right. They're very important. Thank you very much. Brilliant presentation. We've got a 10-minute break, and then it's Jeff Camlet.